everyone. Welcome to our 25th anniversary event. And uh, this event is one of the 25 events that we organized on this occasion at the GCSP. And thank you so much for joining us. There are uh, almost 150 of you uh, participants out there from all uh, continents, I believe. And we are uh, pleased and honored that you join us with um, a prestigious panel of speakers. Uh, of course, um, this opportunity is to listen first to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, who uh, uh, graciously accepted to speak to us. Unfortunately, he could not be with us in this live session because he's traveling, but he uh, accepted to send a video with his uh, message on several topics, several questions that we asked him. And there we are going to uh, comment on and discuss with a panel of other prestigious experts, Angela Cain, former High Representative of the United Nations uh, for Disarmament Affairs, now uh, a fellow at the Vienna Center on Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Uh, Peter Jenkins, who was the United Kingdom permanent representative to uh, Vienna, uh, to the organizations in Vienna, including the IAEA, and now he's the uh, head of British Pogwash. And uh, last but not least, uh, John Burry, who is uh, currently the officer in charge or acting director of the UN uh, Institute for Disarmament Research. And uh, uh, all of them are, of course, eminent experts in the field of non-proliferation, arms control, and disarmament. And these are uh, some of the topics that uh, will be raised, uh, will be addressed uh, in this video by Rafael Grossi. Before we listen to the video, I would like to mention that this session is being recorded and it will be um, uh, further on uh, broadcast or podcast on our um, website and social media. Uh, and second, that uh, after our discussion with the panel, uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions. Actually, you could uh, even prepare your questions in the chat uh, before uh, we conclude uh, our discussion. And uh, my, my colleague Federico will ask, will collect these questions and uh, ask them to the speakers and the panelists. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, listen to what Rafael Grossi has to tell us. I would like to congratulate the Geneva Center for Security Policy on its 25th anniversary. Over the past quarter of a century, the center has made an indelible contribution to security policy around the world. Its courses have helped spread the civilian-led rather than military-led approach to security policy from Budapest to Beijing. More than 5,000 individuals, including ministers, ambassadors, and experts, make up the GCSP's influential alumni network. As threats and opportunities evolve, I am confident that the GCSP will remain as relevant in the coming quarter of a century as it has been in the last. As I prepared these remarks, I made a note of this event's slogan. In 2020, the new normal is anything but. It certainly feels that way, but is what we are living through really all new? Let's look back at what was happening in November 1995, when the GCSP was founded. In Ohio, the Dayton Accords were reached, spelling the end of the Bosnian War. In Israel, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, while in Iraq, Operation Desert Storm 
officially came to an end. And just like today, in pharmaceutical laboratories across the globe, scientists were working speedily to find a way to fight a deadly pandemic. In this case, it was AIDS. For the IAEA and those of us in the nuclear non-proliferation community, an important moment in 1995 was the indefinite extension of the non-proliferation treaty. Today, we are preparing for the 10th review of this important and dynamic agreement. What strikes me when I think about all these historical events is the evolutionary nature of our challenges. They are, in fact, not entirely new and unpredictable. And I shall return to the NPT in a moment, but I would like to start with COVID-19. To date, the IAEA has sent nearly 2,000 consignments of equipment for virus detection and diagnosis and some other supplies to 126 countries and territories. It is by far the most ambitious campaign we have ever launched. But this pandemic has also prompted us to think longer term and more strategically. From Zika to Ebola, zoonotic diseases plague us every few years. And each time the IAEA has helped by using nuclear technology. We can also use that technology better and earlier, however. We already know it can detect a virus's spread at points where we can stop that virus becoming an exponential nightmare. The IAEA has been working for decades on this in its network of veterinary laboratories, but we have not been joining the dots and leveraging all our experience with these viruses, especially in less developed countries. This is why I have proposed a new program called Zodiac. It stands for Supporting National and Regional Capacity in Integrated Action for Control of Zoonotic Diseases. Zodiac is the way nuclear science, technologies, and applications add value to the ongoing efforts by the international community to stop and defeat COVID-19 and prevent the next pandemic of zoonotic origin. It is the nuclear factor in a winning international equation that builds on many years of experience. So while we react to this pandemic, I'm asking member states to think more strategically and fund this long-term project, Zodiac, that will help us ensure we never find ourselves in this terrible situation again. This is a good example of a crisis leading to innovation. And the maxim is true for nuclear proliferation as well. Born of the Cold War, the NPT has made an immense contribution to the safety and well-being of billions of people. For the past 50 years, it has brought tangible benefits in security and in the peaceful uses of nuclear technology. The IAEA has played a key role in its implementation. Without the treaty, its powerful norms against proliferation and the important role of our inspectors, we might well be living in the world of many nuclear armed states that US President John F. Kennedy predicted back in the 1960s. Like a coin, the NPT and the IA have two indivisible sides. There is, of course, the mandate to ensure that nuclear technologies do not pass into the wrong hands or cause inadvertent harm to people and the environment. But there is another side, which is often overlooked, but equally as important. Through its technical cooperation program, the IAEA supports its member states' economic development. It does this by promoting the use of nuclear science and technology in curing cancer, making sure food is safe to eat, boosting crop yields and providing clean energy, among many other things. In this way, the IAEA and nuclear technology helps many nations fulfill various UN development goals, particularly with regards to the environment. 
in my role as Director General, I have set a new tone when it comes to nuclear power and climate change. I have been clear. Nuclear will be part of the energy mix if we are to meet our climate obligations. This is why my first trip as DG was to COP25 in Madrid, where I made precisely that point. As the economic engine of the world moves eastward towards Asia, and particularly China, I'm hopeful that nuclear power will play an increasing role in allowing for robust economic development with the emissions that cause climate change. Without the emissions that cause climate change, of course. As I said, these important uses of nuclear energy that underpin many of the IAEA's activities are one side of the coin, and the other is our job as guardian or watchdog, the nuclear watchdog, as they say. Only through the confidence that the NPT and the IAEA provide about nuclear non-proliferation can millions of people benefit from the extensive use of nuclear science and technology to help raise their standard of living. But of course, there are clouds on the horizon. As with other treaties, the NPT relies on nations respecting international law and norms, and we have witnessed the fragility in this respect, the undermining of certain international laws and institutions, in some cases even disregard of treaties, and the closing of borders are serious challenges to non-proliferation and to the future of nuclear technology in general. This is why it is important that the IAA maintain its reputation as an international organization with teeth. We must remain steadfast in being fair and firm. This is how I approached my visit to Tehran earlier this year. I was firm that inspectors had to gain access to all sites, but fair, in that I listened and engaged without bias. The IAEA does not shy away from the truth. And this month, we made clear that Iran's answers to our inspectors have not been satisfactory on a couple of things. Deeply unsatisfactory is also the position of North Korea, which has not been cooperating with the agency for a very long time. Nevertheless, we continue our monitoring from outside its closed borders and remain ready to re-engage as soon as we are called upon to do so. And this will happen. Syria remains an unfinished matter that requires constructive engagement. Ten years ago, the IAEA's board of governors came to the conclusion that the country had not declared installations as it was due. It is time to talk again. Often, you have to play the long game. That is true also in our role in the establishment of a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Upon the General Conference request, the IAEA Secretariat has been providing technical support to member states in the Middle East in this regard since 1989. It is obvious that there remain long-standing and fundamental difference, differences among countries about the application of comprehensive agency safeguards to all nuclear activities in the region. So we continue our consultations until circumstances are right for progress. Another important area which the IAEA is looking at is nuclear safety and nuclear security. Of course, with the increase of uh, the use, and the peaceful use, uses of nuclear energy, nuclear safety, the harmonization of rules to make sure that nuclear energy is dispatched in a way that is safe to our communities is essential. And the IAEA is at the center of that. Nuclear security as well. In the past few years, we have seen a lot of uh, political, high level and much welcome political activity with a number of summits, as you may remember. After all of that, and when the limelights are off, everything comes back to the agency because the agency is where the rubber hits the road and where all the intentions and all the analysis about nuclear security can turn into operational realities. Finally, I would like to talk to you about one other long and evolutionary process 
which is key to our future success. It may surprise you that the issue I will raise is gender equality, but I have no doubt of its importance. Not only are we currently leaving a great pool of talent untapped, but it has been shown repeatedly that organizations with diverse teams, especially at the top, do a better job. This is why I have made it a priority in my tenure as IAEA's sixth Director General. To that end, I have set the goal of gender parity among senior IAEA staff by 2025. It is ambitious, I know, but I believe it is achievable. Second, I have launched the IAEA's Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellowship Program in order to increase significantly the number of women working in the nuclear field. It provides highly motivated and talented female students scholarships for master's degree programs and then an opportunity to pursue IAEA internships afterwards. The inaugural group of 100 fellows come from 72 countries and from all over the world and all regions. The program has received more than 5 million euros in pledges, for which I am both grateful and proud. Crises often require tried and tested solutions, such as the RT-PCR tests that detect COVID-19. But let us not forget to use the momentum of change to find new long-term solutions such as Zodiac or the Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellowship. Ladies and gentlemen, the GCSP has shown over the past 25 years how important it is to exchange knowledge and views while adapting to the evolving security environment. I think the Center for its contributions to informing and educating both the general public and practitioners about complex issues that require clarity and thoughtfulness. While our role as an international organization is a different one, I do not think that I err if I say that our objectives are exactly the same. I celebrate this first quarter of a century of the center, and as I start at the helm of the agency, I can assure you of my willingness to engage with you and contribute to shed light on the problems and the processes that affect us all in our quest for a more stable and peaceful world. So thank you very much uh, to the Director General for this uh, detailed uh, uh, insight and, and uh, panorama of the activities of the agency and the challenges that it is facing uh, in today's world. Uh, first, apologies uh, for the quality of the sound. I hope you managed to increase the level. Um, and also, sorry about some mistakes in the subtitles. Uh, apparently, the software is not too familiar with the terminology of uh, nuclear safeguards. But I'm sure the, you have you have been correcting yourselves uh, these uh, small mistakes. Um, I would like now to call on uh, our panelists and ask them a few questions about some of the points that were raised uh, in, the, in the Director General's video. Uh, maybe we'll start with Angela about the, the general context, the international context, uh, you know, the pandemic, the challenges to international arms control architecture, um, that were mentioned as, is in, in, as a new background of the activities of the agency. How, how did you find the uh, Director General um, approach? Thank you very much, Mark. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you and with such distinguished co-panelists. 
Um, I uh, must say that um, the uh, Rafael Grossi, the director general, is now just about one year in the in the office, and of course he took office just about two three months before the pandemic really closed business for most of us. And uh, when I look back on it, I must say that I think the first year, despite the pandemic influence, has been a very positive one for, for the agency. And when he talks about the challenges uh, of COVID and also sees it as an opportunity because he mentions two of the initiatives that he launched during this time. But one thing that he doesn't talk about, because when I looked at the website just in preparation also for this meeting, there's always the statement like the inspections and the travel goes on as is. And that to me is, a bit of a needs a bit of clarification, you know, with people traveling, not only the dangers of traveling of exposure to COVID, but going to countries uh, where also COVID is prevalent. And again, from what I am aware of, is that about 20% of all the inspections right now take place in Iran. So that means a good chunk of the personnel travels to Iran is there is exposed. And that is with all of the difficulties, it seems to me that the program goes on as before would need a bit of clarification. Is that really the presence? Is that really the, the, the clarity? The other issue is the, um, the Zodiac, or rather that was preceded by a rather large donation, primarily I think by the, uh, by the US and also some other countries that uh, donated money to WHO, to, uh, to uh, IAEA in order to distribute like masks. And, and that then evolved into using nuclear technology in order to assist in the pandemic fight. Again, that is very positive, but I have a question, of course, also, because how does that work with WHO? And I think it was a bit unfortunate that the US gave money to a large amount of money to, um, to IEA uh, and uh, did not do it with WHO, where I think there should have been like a community of, uh, of international organizations fighting the same fight. And that is, again, my question also for the future. How does that develop? How does the Zodiac develop in conjunction with WHO? Now, the other, when you talk about the challenges uh, of the, uh, the current international pandemic, uh, I, uh, the current international context, then, of course, the other question that I have is um, he speaks quite a bit about the NPT, but he doesn't speak about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And uh, I had tried to find if there was a statement made by him or by someone in the agency or on behalf of the agency by a spokesman on the entry into force, the 50th uh, ratification that was received in October, uh, on the entry into force of the TPNW, and there wasn't. And I find that rather regrettable because this is an agency that deals with nuclear security. And the TPNW, like it or not, is a fact and is also involved with nuclear security. So that I found a great gap, particularly since other very prominent members, Secretary General Guterres, the Pope, Archbishops, ICRC, you name it, have become out and very strongly in favor of the PT TPNW and its entry into force. Let me stop here and turn over to the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you, Angela. Um, uh, Peter, because uh, you, you served at uh, the IEA, so you know all about this, uh, uh, you know, the diplomatic aspect of the, the statements by the Director General who has to take into consideration the, the member states and not to appear one-sided, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so what do you make of uh, his presentation of the, the general context now for the action of the agency? Well, I, I thought that the Director General's uh, statement was um, very carefully uh, drafted, very carefully considered in order to avoid um, giving offence to any member of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, and I think that's probably why there was no mention of the treaty on the uh, prohib prohibition of nuclear weapons, since, as we all know, some of the more important members of the agency are, are not happy with that uh, treaty, to put it mildly. Um, I think that's that's natural. I think any of us in his position would would do the same. And so we must we must make allowances on that score. Um, what, what I would prefer to talk about, if you would allow me, Mark, unless you have it in mind to raise this as a separate question, is um, the prospects for uh, nuclear arms control, because he, he did touch on the fact that uh, we have a nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conference coming up um, in August of 2021. Uh, and of course, we also mercifully uh, have a new US administration uh, coming into the White House 
um, on the 20th of January, uh, an administration that there's every reason to hope uh, will be much more interested in making progress on arms control uh, than the Trump administration has been. Um, I think the first priority for that administration will of course be to extend New START, uh, which as you and all your listeners will know is due to expire on, I think it's the 5th of February, uh, but with the, the right political will, um, it should be possible to uh, arrange an extension, even though time will be, will obviously be short. Uh, what, what I would particularly like to, to, to focus on is um, no first use. Um, it came to my notice recently that back in January 2017, just before the end of uh, um, President-elect Biden's term as vice president, um, he gave a speech on uh, nuclear arms control matters uh, in which he appeared to be uh, sympathetic to no first use. Um, when one bears it, when one um, remembers that um, China is already um, committed to a no first use doctrine, uh, and that it, there is at least a possibility uh, that Russia's nuclear modernization program of the last decade may have put President Putin into a position where he might be more sympathetic to no first use uh, than Russia has been for quite some time, uh, then I think there is um, something of a case uh, for a large number of non-nuclear weapon states uh, to use the August NPT review conference uh, to press the P5 very hard uh, to make a collective pledge uh, to refrain um, from the first use of nuclear weapons. Uh, as, as I'm sure you and many of your listeners know, uh, the United States and Russia have been keeping open uh, the option of first use, uh, partly in order to uh, be able to use the threat of nuclear weapons uh, to deter conventional attack, attacks. Uh, to my mind, that, that is morally unacceptable. Um, the, uh, the kind of um, damage that the use of nuclear weapons would cause, um, the disproportionate loss of um, non-combatant lives, um, Re 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 render would render, I think, the use of nuclear weapons in response to a conventional attack uh, incompatible uh, with um, the just use of force. Uh, of course, um, first use would also be foolish because it would entail the risk of um, a nuclear es escalation, possibly leading to the to the end of mankind. Um, so, so for those reasons, I, as I say, I think it would be very, very positive um, if the NPT review conference could be used to put no first use right at the top of the uh, nuclear arms control agenda at the top at the start of um, President-elect Biden's term in office. If that can be achieved, then I would imagine that it could actually be easier uh, for the um, Americans and the Russians to agree further reductions in their very large holdings of nuclear weapons. As you know, they both still have getting on for uh, 4,000 4, nuclear weapons in their possession, far more than China, the UK or France. Uh, but if they have once renounced the option of first use, perhaps it'll be easier for them to contemplate really quite significant reductions uh, in those holdings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, now, John, uh, what's your first reaction? Um, of course, the one I would say one good aspect of the DG's uh, statement is the, <coughs> I guess, the, the importance of uh, multilateralism and, and the multilateral uh, approach to international crises, and uh, the pandemic is one of them, but also the non-proliferation crises that he mentioned also, uh, you know, um, with the role of the agency, but uh, also the importance of the NPT. Um, uh, you know, uh, 
how do you assess this uh, plea in favor of multilateralism? Mm. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, well, let me preface my remarks by congratulating you and GCSP for your 25th anniversary uh, from UNIDEA, which is another in, um, entity celebrating an anniversary this year. And we've benefited a lot um, from the expertise and insights uh, and contributions of the GCSP over the years, uh, including between uh, from you, Mark, uh, in terms of your work, both at the GCSP, but also as a former senior fellow at UNIDES. So, uh, and we've worked with you since, of course, on things like negative security assurances. So it's with real pleasure that I join you and, and Angela and Peter today on this panel. So I couldn't help but think as I was listening to the statement, how uh, Ambassador Grossi must be uh, sighing an inward uh, sigh of relief, I suppose, at not having to preside over the next MPT review conference. And this was supposed to be in the spring of 2020, um, but the RevCon's of course been postponed twice now to January 2021 and now to August. And as if COVID hasn't made things hard enough, I think as Angela pointed out, his Argentinian successor, uh, Gustavo Zlavanen, faces a host of obstacles to navigating a successful outcome there. And I think it's not clear yet whether a double postponement helps or hinders those chances, uh, but it's become the review process that never ends for most of us. And I mean, you mentioned the Biden administration, and I think it'll be a windfall to have a US administration re-engaged in multilateral leadership on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. And I think many will welcome that, but it's unlikely to resolve differences over the Middle East, tensions between the nuclear weapon states, Iran, DPRK, and also lack of progress toward implementation of prior agreements made under the disarmament pillar in the NPT, at least not by August. But the outcome of the RevCon is of concern to the agency, as DG Grossi knows better than anyone, since that treaty helps to give legitimacy to the safeguards regime and many of the IAEA's other activities. So in this sense, it's interesting that while he spoke of two sides of the coin in his uh, video statement of sort of non-proliferation security uh, on one side and peaceful purposes on the other, of course, there's a third dimension and that's nuclear disarmament. And that's gonna be the toughest of the three review pillars to deal with in August. Which uh, brings me to the TPNW. And I very much agree with what Angela said before. I mean, you know, the dissatisfaction of many non-nuclear weapon states with the perceived lack of progress on nuclear disarmament led to the TPNW's emergence. And it's now got the 50 ratifications needed for it to enter into force on the 22nd of January. And all of the states that have joined the TPNW also adhere to safeguards. They are part of the IAEA as well. But you wouldn't know that from his statement. And Peter is no doubt correct when he, he points out that, you know, uh, Ambassador Grossi has serious responsibilities and he has to be tactful um, to all states. And also, I mean, given the composition of the Board of Governors of the IAEA and the hostility of many of those governments to the TPNW, it's, it's not surprising. But what I hope is that it doesn't signal a reluctance by the agency to engage in dialogue with TPNW states parties and civil society on the implementation of that new treaty. You know, supporters of the TPNW have been at pains to argue that this new treaty complements the NPT. And it's true that there's skepticism from the nuclear armed states and some of their allies, as well as some quasi independent experts from those countries. But the fact of the matter is that if the nuclear non-proliferation regime is to be preserved and strengthened, then dialogue will be needed, including between the agency and the regime of the TPNW. And for one thing, I mean, the IAEA has really important technical and legal expertise on nuclear verification and has a lot of institutional acumen. So its advice would help the fledgling regime to avoid uh, serious mistakes and, you know, in that respect to the TPNW negotiations in 2017, which I attended, uh, the IAEA was missing in action, even though it had been invited by the chair of those negotiations to observe. So it would have been good in a perfect world to have heard from the DG about what the agency plans to do to engage on the TPNW. But, you know, the reality is, I think, as Angela pointed out, a constructive relationship is needed because it's in everyone's best interests. 
And then finally, you know, the elephant in the room is this tense international security climate between several of the nuclear armed states. And this is creating all sorts of problems for ensuring the compliance and enforcement of WMD related regimes and agreements. You only have to see what's been going on in the context of the chemical weapons regime, which I think Angela could tell you much more about. She's been deeply involved in these things in the past. But, you know, we're witnessing a negative trust spiral between some of these nuclear armed states that's leading to intensifying strategic competition, including in the nuclear sphere. But, you know, institutions like the IAEA and regimes like the NPT on which it rests, they're critical parts of an international rules-based order in which state-on-state -state violence is kept to a lawful minimum. And as a relatively new IAEA supremo and one intimately familiar with the politics of nuclear weapons diplomacy, um, you know, I think Ambassador Grossi has a lot to offer in terms of what he can um, he can uh, talk about, what he can demonstrate. For instance, uh, just the other week, uh, he said publicly that he did not think that military strikes on Iran was a good idea. He was against that, and I think that's very helpful. Um, and I would note that several of his predecessors, such as Hans Blix, were quite outspoken yet measured in respect to arms control issues. They really demonstrated that the uh, agency can um, show international leadership there. And the agency really has critical expertise and authority. They do a tremendous job in so many areas. And I know there'll be some of them listening in today, personnel of the agency, and I really commend them for the work that they do. Uh, and I hope that uh, you know the agency will, will continue to be at the forefront of uh, developing or endorsing new verification approaches, for instance, that could help in future arms control and disarmament agreements. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> now, of course, one of the issues raised uh, by the Director General and that you already touched on, because it is very much connected. It's one of the pillars, one of the three pillars of the NPT's promotion of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So that's one of the main missions of the agency. But it's of course connected with the other pillars of the uh, NPT, such as uh, non-proliferation and disarmament. Um, uh, so do you think, Angela, that um, this uh, issue of promoting nuclear energy as uh, a solution to the climate change crisis, as uh, Raphael mentioned, or as a path to economic development, uh, still needs to be at the forefront of the action of the agency, um, irrespective or uh, in relation to, to the, the, the risk of non proliferation which required uh, safeguards. You know, the, um, <clears throat> I find it interesting because of course, Rafael Grossi, when he was the president designate for the uh, um, 2020 at the time, uh, NPT review conference also stressed the peaceful use of nuclear energy. I mean, that was going to be the main thrust of the focus of the, um, of the conference. And uh, there were many voices at the time already who said, well, you know, we don't really need to demonstrate the success of the peaceful uses because that's the one pillar that's really worked well. Uh, we really should focus, on the other hand, on the disarmament issue, for example. Now, I understand that uh, when it comes to IEA and his predecessor in particular, has always stressed that every single speech I heard him made is, we're a technical agency, we're not a political agency. And I think, and I agree with my previous uh, panelists, speakers, that uh, Grossi has really stuck out his head a bit more on the political side than his predecessors have. And I credit him with that because he has been a lot more outspoken, you know, not only and we'll talk that, about that maybe a little bit later, you know, traveling to Iran, et cetera, to confront that head on. So I give him great credit for that. But on the other hand, the peaceful uses, you don't really need to convince anyone because that's worked. Now he's also come out and said, yes, and you mentioned that Mark, yes, uh, I'm all in favor of nuclear energy for energy consumption and energy production. Now, that is a bit controversial at this point. And it is controversial, not only in my own country in Germany, which wants to totally eliminate nuclear energy generation to begin with, but also among the young people of this world. When you listen to some of the polls that have been conducted or you read about them, you find out that there is a lot of, um, a lot of opposition to nuclear energy. And it isn't because it's nuclear, but it is also because what do you do actually? And the, everyone seems to be totally quiet about that. What do you do with the, with, uh, with the stuff that comes out of it. You have to somehow 
um, take care of it. You know, it's, there is, is, is uh, byproducts that come out of the nuclear energy production. What do you do with them? Africa doesn't want them anymore. They have sort of said, no, we're not going to take them anymore. And no one seems to me that I know about working very actively to sort of say, yes, if we are going to have nuclear energy production, and yes, it is cheaper, and yes, it is efficient in many ways, but what are we going to do with the byproducts? That, to my mind, is something that is 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 rather is rather you know needs to be explored a lot further. I'd like to hear more about it. And the other problem that I have with the nuclear energy production is when you think about Saudi Arabia, for example. I mean, Saudi Arabia wants to build oh, about thirty five, I think, uh, thirty five new uh, nuclear power plants because they're saying oil is phasing out. We need to replace it, and so therefore we're building it. Now there's a fly in the ointment there, and the fly in the ointment is, of course, that uh, they um, uh, would like to enrich uranium themselves rather than getting the HEU from abroad. And that is a problem. And again, I give Rafael um, credit for that because he has pointed out that even though Saudi Arabia has one of those small quantities protocol, but it has no possibilities for IEA to inspect and verify, and that's their job. They inspect and verify, but they cannot inspect and verify the peaceful nature of the program. And he has also said that uh, it should be amended, this SPQ, because there are a number of countries uh, that have it. I mean, this is for countries that have very small quantities uh, of nuclear material. But uh, there was a new version that was introduced in 2005. I mean, so that's 15 years back. And 94 states have um, adopted it, but 31 have not, and that includes Saudi Arabia. So in peaceful uses of energy, you really have to look at what is good about it, what needs to be done in terms of the, uh, the material that comes out of it that you need to dispose of, but also what about the countries that want to build nuclear power plants and how are they going to be inspected, verified, and what standards do they adhere to? And that is something that I think really needs to be explored further. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, Peter, you've, because you've been, you've, you followed these uh, aspects very closely when you were in Vienna. Uh, do you agree that uh, now it's not so clear as it was in the past that nuclear energy is the solution to, well, to force to fight uh, climate change, is the best economical solution, is the um, safest uh, solution? Uh, is, and, and economical uh, in, in the sense that it sometimes when we talk about the, the price of the energy, you don't include the uh, all the, the, the capital costs, uh, the cost of uh, dealing with the waste, uh, decommissioning, and, the, and all this. So uh, in, in the end, will not the, the market decide, you know, that, for instance, uh, solar and wind renewable energies will be safer and less costly than nuclear energy. So it, of course, it competition with fossil fuels is, is already won by renewables. But uh, what about nuclear versus renewables? I think you're right, Mark. Um, at least as far as I know, um, nuclear energy is becoming, uh, if anything, more expensive. Uh, due to higher uh, nuclear safety standards, um, not least due to that. Um, and um, I think it's as the price of solar and wind falls, um, it's fallen dramatically over the last decade, um, I think it'll be much harder for nuclear energy to compete on price grounds in future. Um, I agree also with you and with Angela um, that nuclear waste management is a very serious issue. Um, I think the, the, the third um, element, if you like, uh, which um, has been used to attack nuclear power has, has of course, been proliferation. Um, I'm less, um, less convinced that, that it's legitimate to attack nuclear power on those grounds because safeguarded nuclear power reactors uh, pre present a very small uh, nuclear proliferation risk. But of course, if a country does insist on acquiring uh, the nuclear, a nuclear fuel cycle capability, in other words, the uh, capability to produce nuclear fuel for its reactors, uh, then we are into the same sort of problem as has been evident in the Iranian case for the last 20 years, 
uh, with uh, outsiders uh, fearing uh, the dual use potential of um, enrichment in, in particular, uh, because fuel for nuclear power reactors is low enriched, but uh, fuel for nuclear weapons is merely high, highly enriched uh, uranium. Um, so I, if I were the DG, I think I would perhaps uh, be relatively silent about, the, um, about promoting nuclear power, and I would instead put most of my accent on the application of other forms of nuclear technology uh, to health, uh, to food and agriculture, uh, to water, to the environment. Um, these applications, they're not spectacular, uh, but they can be very useful. And they're certainly valued uh, by um, a large majority of IEA member states which I'm sure is why um, Rafael Grossi is giving them the kind of priority he is giving. Uh, but one mustn't be cynical about that. I mean, if that's what they value, well, then it's important that they, they get that out of their membership of the, of the agency, uh, because um, that, one can hope at least, will strengthen their readiness to support uh, the agency, um, the agency's safeguards system, which is of no direct benefit to most of them, um, and the um, nuclear non-proliferation treaty um, that lies behind both. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, John, uh, following up on this, uh, uh, is there a reason to worry about this trend that we can see, especially in the Middle East, of uh, considering uh, nuclear energy production as a sign of development, but also prestige, uh, supporting, supported by nationalism, uh, with, of course, the um, now associating sovereignty with the uh, the capacity to 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 master the whole fuel cycle. Uh, we, you hear these uh, noises coming from the Middle East that uh, uh, there shouldn't be any impediment uh, to enriching uranium because it's part of our sovereignty. It's our alienable right under the NPT, um, and that of course uh, contains uh, this this risk of uh, proliferation. Yeah, I think uh, there is reason to be concerned, Mark. Uh, uh, be, you know, when you take the Middle East region, for instance, uh, there's a region that is fraught with tensions, in which many conflicts have been fought, and there is no uh, really coherent political process to lead that region from where it is right now to somewhere that's, I think, uh, more stable and more secure. And so, uh, in that context, uh, you know, when you talk about inalienable rights. Uh, well, I mean, you know, inalienable to the extent that, uh, you know, the actions of uh, those states comply with agreements under international law that they've reached, and those include nuclear safeguards. Um, a couple of other points I wanted to make, I mean, I very much agree with the other panelists in terms of what, of what they've said about, um, you know, the emphasis that the agency has on nuclear energy. and. I guess in part that also reflects, uh, you know, the history and the provenance of the agency, uh, you know, when it was set up and for some decades afterwards. But, you know, we are not living in the same world. Um, you know, Angela mentioned that countries like Germany are, are transitioning away from reliance on nuclear energy. There are also quite a few countries out there who've never seen nuclear energy as something beneficial uh, and something to be part of the mix for them. Uh, I live in Switzerland, which depends in part on nuclear energy and is now uh, saddled with uh, reactors that are coming to the end of the useful lives and will be incredibly expensive to decommission. Uh, and other countries are similarly affected. In the United States, there are dozens of plants which are, really should be shut down uh, for safety reasons, but continue to operate because the cost of decommissioning would bankrupt their operators. So one really has to question the economics uh, of nuclear energy in at least some contexts. In my own country of nationality, New Zealand, we've never seen a place for nuclear energy. Uh, and uh, you know that was well before we've seen 
the advances in recent decades in renewables, including solar, wind, wave power, also geothermal. Um, and as the efficiency of those technologies continues to improve, I think the economics for many are going to skew further and further um, away from nuclear energy, although it is going to continue, I think, to play an important role uh, in some contexts as uh, a way to even out, uh, I guess, uh, electricity production uh, and, you know, transmission, but, you know, also um, as uh, economies, you know, transition toward uh, other, other other means. So, you know, we'll be with with nuclear energy for a while yet, but I think that uh, we should be critically questioning um, the emphasis uh, on nuclear energy. And I would entirely agree with what Peter said. I think that the, um, you know, the importance of nuclear technology, particularly, you know, medicine and agriculture and other areas, maybe it's not as sexy, but it's actually, I mean, it's something that affects us in our everyday lives just as much as electricity transmission and generation does. So, you know, these are exciting things and, and the agency could make more of that, particularly, I think, given its very important technical role in helping to incubate some of these technologies. Uh, and, you know, uh, the DG in his statement mentioned, uh, for example, you know, this uh, Zodiac project and other things. But for many decades, the agency's played an important and valuable role. Uh, and and I, have, I very much hope that it continues to do so. Can I just come in here for one second, uh, Mark? And I want to add one aspect uh, that uh, has not been mentioned, and that is what introducing nuclear power plants into areas that are inherently unstable. Unstable. I mean, think about, for example, Chernobyl is, what, 36 years ago now? Fukushima, you know, was in a more recent past. John mentioned some of these old plants in, uh, in the United States, particularly, which were built on, on fault lines um, that could very easily... Um, be affected by an earthquake or something. But the other thing is we also remember when an oil field or rather oil producer was attacked in Saudi Arabia with drones. And I find it extremely dangerous that if you have a nuclear power plant that is subject to an attack by whatever means, and that therefore could contaminate a huge amount you know, of, of area and surface. So that is to my mind, another aspect that we really should think about when we talk about introducing nuclear power plants. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, uh, now, the, because in the discussion about nuclear energy, there is uh, some, you can see now some literature about potential conversion of nuclear power, uh, power generation to the production of uh, so-called green hydrogen, which could be, of course, a, a green a renewable source, uh, you know, not, not without any Green ga greenhouse gas emissions could be stored uh, just like uh, oil, for instance. Um, do you think this is uh, realistic to expect that the whole industry will um, gradually move towards that kind of production? Or at the moment, of course, it's not uh, viable e economically. That's why there's less incentive but uh, over the years, do you think that could be one option? Anyone? Peter? I'm afraid I have to pass on that, Mark, because I'm not really familiar with the, the proposed technology, but it seems to me that even if you use uh, nuclear power plants to produce hydrogen, uh, you still have some of the other problems that we've been talking about. Uh, the high cost of decommissioning and also the problem of what to do with uh, nuclear waste. I mean, I take it there would still be uh, some some nuclear waste. Yes, and so there is the, also the option of uh, moving, transitioning from using uranium to uh, thorium, which is less prone to non -pro to proliferation uh, and has. Uh, also produces less uh, less waste, but again, you know, this is this seems a little bit uh, far fetched at the moment. But let's be aware that uh, this uh, discussion is is ongoing. Now, I'd like to move to. Uh, well, of course, we've already talked about some of the non-proliferation, or, or rather, the proliferation crises 
uh, regionally. We talked about uh, Iran, North Korea. The DG mentioned Syria, which is not often mentioned in this uh, context because there were, there were some attempts uh, to build a reactor that was destroyed uh, by an uh, Israeli airstrike. Um, uh, what is your uh, view on prospects for solving the Iran uh, crisis? You know, we know that Biden has pledged to uh, rejoin, re-enter the JCPOA. Do you think this can be done smoothly or that um, now the price for going back to normal will be much higher. Angela? Uh, I think that Biden has already pretty much indicated that he would like to, in his transition plan or before even he was elected, that he would rejoin the JCPOA. I think this would be very exciting to watch because I think, yes, it can be done. I do think the other partners would be highly delighted that they would, uh, that the US would rejoin the JCPOA as obviously would Iran. But Iran has been always also a little bit cautious because what is the condition that they are looking forward to having lifted and that is basically the sanctions regime. And the sanctions regime has been strengthened tremendously. And uh, so therefore that is something that needs to be lifted so that one can get rid of this instex, which has never worked properly anyway, because it just wasn't set up because you couldn't trade in dollars because you would penalize, get penalized by the United States. And so what Iran wants is access to international markets, access to the international financial markets. And if that can be guaranteed by the United States and basically what Biden would have to do as president is these executive orders that were imposed one by one by one would need to be lifted. Now, he can do it because the executive orders are not subject to uh, confirmation by, by the Senate. And that's, of course, still you know, the question of what opposition and what composition will he have of the Senate. That depends on the two, uh, two senators who are going to be elected in, uh, in Georgia, for example. That's going to be in early January. But on the other hand, I think that uh, it would be extremely welcome if this abrogation, unilateral abrogation by Trump of an international treaty, and then trying to reimpose and come back through the back door in, in, uh, in the resolution 2231 and the Security Council of which they were party to, I find this all fascinating. Now, it, it depends a lot uh, on what is happening. And as you know, Iran is also having elections next year. So it isn't really a technical question. It is very much wrapped up in the politics of all thing. And when it comes to the United States and Biden, you don't forget, um, you know, while he got 75 million votes in favor, uh, Trump got something like 71 million in favor. So that is a very considerable size. I mean, there's still a 4 million gap. But on the other hand, that is something that needs to be solved because just like Trump has been selling his program for the last four years, so Biden will have to sell his program. And uh, I am not sure that there's going to be full throttled support in the United States for rejoining the JCPOA. Yes, many in the leadership of the political lines are, particularly from the Democrats. But on the other hand, uh, I would like to see this discussed earlier rather than later, because we cannot be certain exactly what is happening uh, in Iran. I mean, we know that uh, the uh, Rafael Grossi has traveled there. And again, I give him great credit for that. But on the other hand, they just issued a report this month and they said they continue inspections in Iraq, uh, but they don't specify whether they requested access to the military facilities, for example. And uh, so um, what they basically say, which is a little bit indistinct, is that they haven't observed any changes in cooperation uh, with Iran, you know, with, with the IEA. So that's very carefully worded. But I think it's good to hedge at this point because things are in flux and a lot could happen in the next, you know, three, four months, for example. Thank you, Angela. Um, and uh, Peter, do you share this uh, cautious optimism? Yes, essentially, of course, I do very much agree with Angela that um, it would be a reason for um, almost for rejoicing uh, if the uh, if President elect Biden were to move very quickly uh, to rejoin uh, the JCPOA and to lift um, all the sanctions which were introduced by executive action under uh, President Trump, which, as Angela said, can easily be lifted um, by the new president. But I think I'm, I'm less uh, optimistic than she is um, because uh, there, is already, there are already reports 
um, that the president-elect is coming under pressure from uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia not to rejoin the JCPOA. Uh, and because there have been plenty of signs in recent months uh, during various track two exchanges um, that some of um, the new president's um, advisors on Iran are minded uh, to use rejoining and to use the existence of all these Trumpian sanctions uh, as leverage um, to secure from Iran a lot more than simply the reversal of the measures that Iran has taken in retaliation for American withdrawal. Obviously, that's perfectly reasonable to ask that of Iran, and they've made perfectly clear that they'll be ready to, to grant that. Uh, but what's being spoken of as additional demands is, for instance, um, a, um, um, a long-term renunciation, or at least long-term, let's say, uh, prolong indefinite prolongation of restrictions on uranium enrichment in Iran, um, the surrender of longer range uh, missiles in, in Iran's uh, possession and the abandonment of the development of, and, and manufacturing of such missiles um, and um, the termination of uh, Iranian support for Hezbollah uh, and uh, Shia militias. Uh, I can't see any possibility of Iran being interested in uh, negotiating on any of those subsidiary subjects uh, in order to secure um, a, uh, an American, American concessions on the JCPOA. And what worries me most is that this could lead uh, to Iran ceasing to apply uh, the additional protocol. Um, uh, the additional protocol, which as you know, came in in the late 90s, has been proving its worth um, as a uh, deterrent uh, to the diversion of nuclear material or the misuse of nuclear uh, facilities uh, because it makes possible or makes very likely and probable, shall we say, uh, early detection of diversion or misuse. Um, so it would be really quite disturbing uh, to lose um, the additional protocol uh, in uh, Iran. Um, when I recently had the opportunity to ask uh, during a webinar um, a representative of the Iranian government whether he thought they would continue to apply uh, the additional protocol if it turned out to be uh, impossible to revive the JCPOA, um, he declined to answer, which I didn't blame him at all, but which I interpreted as a sign that um, the Iranian government is perhaps keeping, keeping open the option of ceasing to apply the additional protocol, that they're not obliged to apply it other than under the JCPOA. Um, and uh, so I think that, I think, well, what I hope is that at least some of those who still have the ear of Iran's leaders, and I'm thinking of the Russians and the Chinese, uh, will uh, make clear to them uh, that even if the JCPOA cannot be revived, uh, it is important that they continue to apply the JCPOA. And to some extent, it's actually in their interest uh, because it enables the uh, IAEA over time um, to come to a, a conclusion as to whether there are or not any undeclared uh, nuclear facilities or uh, material in Iran. And it's in Iran's interest, I think, um, for the IEA to be able to build um, global confidence in the peaceful nature of Iran's program by uh, providing uh, those assurances. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, John, uh, following on um, what Peter said, Obviously, it will be difficult for Iran to accept uh, to, to, to negotiate on other issues than the, the JCPO itself, uh, such as uh, its, its action in the Middle East or uh, the missile program. But 
if you were an advisor to the Iranian government or regime, uh, would you advise them uh, to take the lead or the, the hand in the negotiation by announcing that they will now first ratify the additional protocol because they have signed it and uh, implementing it so it shouldn't be too difficult. Second, ratify the comprehensive test ban treaty, which they, again they have signed. Um, uh, and, and finally, accede to the TPNW because when it's in force in January, they, you cannot sign it, but you have to accede to it. So that they would give a signal that for them, nuclear weapons is definitely not uh, an option. They would get you know sign sign of good faith and good image, good standing in that uh, aspect. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Mark. I guess I guess the question has to be asked: Who are they demonstrating good faith to? And I think uh, you know if you take those three options working backwards, I, at the moment, until we get a clearer picture of how the TPNW will be implemented, I'm not sure that Iran joining that treaty would. Uh, would be regarded as um, a significant thing by some of the parties to the JCPO or former parties, uh, including the United States. In terms of joining the CTBT, uh, well, that would be welcome, but we all know that the CTBT is some way off entering into force internationally. Um, so, you know, if you were a skeptic, for instance, in the United States uh, Senate, you might say, well, it, it's, it's fine for the Iranians to do that, but you know, what difference does it really make? And in that sense, that leaves the IAEA additional protocol. And I think this goes back to what Peter was saying before that, you know, that is, a, that's very, very important. And so I think that, uh, yes, it would be a, a significant thing for Iran um, to be accepting those sorts of obligations and to send signals that it is doing so uh, to all the international community, actually you know, not just to the United States. Um, and I just make sort of two general points. And one is that I think that, and this is, I think, wholly consistent with what Peter An Angela had been saying, is that some realism on both sides, both the Iranian and the American sides is, is needed in the sense that um, if, they, if there's going to be major reopening of the JCPOA or broadening and linkage with other things, you know, a shifting of the goalposts. I mean, th that probably isn't going to work. I mean, it's not going to be a deal at any cost for either side, you know. Um, but if, as, you know, uh, Angela said, you know, moves could be made relatively quickly toward uh, the US, uh, you know, rejoining the deal, um, and that were matched with some confidence uh, building uh, steps on the Iranian side, whether that, you know, concern the IAEA additional protocol or something else. I think that would be good, but we shouldn't hold our breath. I think that there'll be too much more than that. And especially are, as there are these countervailing, uh, you know, forces, uh, you know, uh, who are not so keen on the deal. Uh, and the second point uh, and last point that I'd make is, I mean, this is really a good uh, example of why a rules-based international order and the agency are so valuable in the sense that there we have an international agency which is quietly and tactfully getting on with the job of um, trying to be as, as neutral as possible, but, um, you know, uh, trying to get to the bottom of, of what is going on with Iran's um, nuclear activities. And uh, thank heavens we live in a world where the agency is there doing its work. Um, you know, as serious as the challenges currently uh, that exist are, uh, as opposed to a world in which we didn't have the agency and it wasn't undertaking these activities because we could well have seen war by now. Um, and, you know, so, you know, hats off again to the agency to the very difficult task that they do. Thank you, John. <clears throat> now, very often the, there is a parallel made between the case of Iran and the case of North Korea. And North Korea, of course, appears as, as the bad example of what should not have been done, because in the end, uh, the way the, the issue was handled led to the decision by North Korea to develop and explode nuclear weapons 
and eventually obtain some of what it was seeking, such as a form of recognition, negotiation, even bilateral with the United States. So isn't this the worst example? Uh, again, sharing the blame on all sides for letting this happen and giving uh, this as, as an example or bad example not to follow uh, because you know if you if you obtain what you seek only after exploding nuclear weapons so that's the that's the worst proliferating message you, you can give angela what do you think i think this makes the best case for not having nuclear weapons at all if you want my opinions and uh, that basically there were voices for example that um, were very loud after uh, Russia uh, basically took Crimea from Ukraine and it was like, well, if the Ukraine had not given up nuclear weapons in 1992, they wouldn't be in that situation. That is, the big elephant in the room is, of course, the four countries that do have nuclear weapons and that are outside of the NPT. So they are not you know, discussed here. But on the other hand, I find as much as I appreciate that there was a move made by Trump, and it's one of the few things I appreciate, let me be very open, um, but as much as I appreciate that, that there was an attempt made to at least get into a dialogue. But what it meant is that North Korea was recognized as a nuclear power on an eye level with the president of the United States. I find that you know, unacceptable. And what worries me also, and that comes back to what uh, uh, Peter also said about, um, you know, was Iran or is Iran in contravention of the of the NPT or has it violated the NPT? There is no standard for determining what is a violation of the NPT. There's no investigation mechanism of such that you can sort of say, well, you know, you're in contravention. And again, what worries me about that is that already, I think it was Saudi Arabia and maybe one other country in the Middle East that has said, if um, Iran gets the bomb, we'll get one too. I, that I find extremely concerning. So the only way forward is really to have a dialogue, to start a dialogue and to sort of say, how do we deal with this? How do we go forward? How do we get a world that is safer? Because we all know how inherently unstable with all the conflicts and with the geopolitical upheavals that we've seen in the last couple of years, the world has become. So the problem is who is going to actually do that right now? I think it's gonna to be too much to put on the shoulders of Biden, but on the other hand, the other nuclear powers have also a just as high a responsibility, irrespective of the numbers. And I heard you, Peter, uh, you know, the 4,000 or 6,000 each, you know, Russia and US, whatever they have now, doesn't really matter. And China as well. China needs to be in on the dialogue. So there has to be a much more concerted effort to talk about what are we doing in this world? How does, and if the IEA can assist that by sort of saying, yes, we can do verification. And verification, I think, has changed. It's not only a physical inspection. I mean, let's be honest, you've got technology now that basically gives very close introspection into whatever has happening in a particular country. Now, I'm not even talking about intelligence briefings, but there is technology, there are tools that can enhance physical inspection, very important. And that also needs to be furthered and probably IAA is doing that. I don't know about all of the details, but that is very, very important to look at now. But to my mind, dialogue, engagement, talking, and trying to come to a way forward to a come, I don't even want to call that a vision, but to just kind of take, even if it's baby steps in the beginning, but to basically try to fix the situation that we're in right now and to make progress of some sort. And uh, that is, to my mind, what is really required these days. Thanks, Angela. Uh, Peter, don't you think that uh, by uh, insisting that nuclear weapons are fundamental for their security, the nuclear weapon states or nuclear armed states uh, actually um, you know, give an incentive for uh, would-be nuclear states to, to develop these weapons. It's in a sense their language, uh, their own language, their own discourse is, is an incentive for proliferation. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, I very much uh, regret that my own government is one of those that I'm afraid falls into that um, logical trap, really, and that moral trap and that political trap. Um, I don't think it's a, an elegant position in which to find oneself at all. Um, uh, 
I think, I mean, to go back to the, the idea of no first use, at least if they could all commit to no first use and make clear that they're only retaining nuclear weapons to serve as a deterrent uh, to deter other nuclear weapon possessing states to use those nuclear weapons against them, and that they're all of them only retaining nuclear weapons until such time as they're able to work out how to get rid of their nuclear weapons uh, in a way that will leave them feeling um, reasonably secure, um, that, that, that would at least, I think, mitigate some of the harm that has been done through this, this posture that you just, um, you just referred to. Um, as far as North Korea is concerned, I, I mean, I was early, it was early on in my spell in Vienna that, um, that the Americans uh, triggered and provoked um, Iran, um, the DPRK's decision to finally uh, withdraw from the NPT and start developing nuclear weapons. This was in the autumn and winter of 2002, early 2003. Um, so I've been following the issue ever since. There have, of course, been a number of attempts, not just the recent ones by President Trump, uh, to persuade uh, the DPRK uh, to surrender its uh, nuclear weapons and to uh, move in the direction of denuclearization, uh, and they've all failed. And that has left me really um, skeptical about the possibility of negotiating um, the elimination of nuclear weapons from North Korea. I think probably we need to think of North Korea in the same way as we think of Israel and India and Pakistan uh, as a nuclear possessor state um, and all four nuclear possessor states. Uh, that, that problem will need to be addressed when the five nuclear weapon states um, uh, get get close to, to, to zero. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, John, um, I, I would uh, hate to deprive you from speaking on this issue, but I see time is running and we have a few questions in, in the chat. So perhaps you'll have a chance to answer uh, one of them that's um, may touch on North Korea. I know there are a number of other topics uh, raised by uh, Rafael Grossi, such as nuclear safety and, and security and gender e equality. But again, we could address these uh, in response to the questions. So Federico, um, what, what question did you select? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And thank you to our, our, our speakers. Um, our first question is, is, is something that uh, Angela lightly touched on. Um, how do you, this is for the whole panel, uh, how do you assess the nuclear renaissance of the Middle East, primary, primarily the UAE and Saudi Arabia in the non-proliferation and security context? How much is their choice of nuclear instead of other renewables bound to those states' security concerns? So... Would you like to answer? Since my name was mentioned as having touched on this, um, I, I think this is very much of concern. And again, what I had mentioned already is that uh, Saudi Arabia has been in talk, has been in talks uh, with the IEA about uh, the safeguards agreement. And uh, so I think they're trying very hard to, um, to, counter some of the arguments that have been made in terms of um, that they would be suspected of enriching and possibly you know, on the way to, to, to building a bomb, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, I must say that this, uh, uh, this small quantities uh, uh, feature that I had mentioned that they haven't signed, I think it would seem to me that that is something they would need to sign uh, in order to uh, assuage any of the doubts that exist. Now, again, Grossi has gone there and he has talked. And again, I give him credit for that because I always believe having worked for the UN for such a long time that the, the one way to, to actually get into a contact and get into a progress mode, so to say, is to actually listen to the other side and to see what can be done. Uh, but I do find it very much of concern that in the Middle East, there are these voices. And that also uh, is a question, and I can't remember if he touched upon this in his, in his message now, 
but it's about the Middle East issue. But I think John already mentioned it in terms of no progress on the Middle East issue or rather very limited progress, particularly when it comes to the P5, which was of course one of the major obstacles in the, um, in the 2015 NPT review conference. So what is the way forward there? I think again, there has to be a lot more engagement. There has to be a lot more engagement. And unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a gap, particularly from the United States in terms of having engagement, but there are the three uh, depositories for this um, 1995 and then 2010 promise about holding the um, conference on the weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East that has never been fulfilled. And now it's been moved forward by the Arab states but on the other hand, that is not the only answer. There needs to be more support from other member states, in particular the nuclear powers, in particular the depository powers. And sorry, Peter, that also goes against the UK. But uh, on the other hand, this is something that needs to be done because the least anyone wants to see is to have more nuclear volatile material, whatever is going on in the Middle East that could destabilize the situation. It's a, it's a powder keg. And I am very concerned about what can happen there and what can actually very quickly get out of hand. And to me, it is one of the foremost issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, Mark, your microphone is muted. Sorry, let's move to the next question. So um, this question is, is for Peter Jenkins, but I think we, we can get more reactions from the panel also. And this is a comment and then a question, so bear with me while uh, I read through it. Um, so this person uh, says, I agree with you, Peter, that moving to a non-first use, to no first use is a vital measure to reduce nuclear weapon risk and pave the way for negotiations for more comprehensive nuclear disarmament. President Obama tried to, to get no first use into his nuclear posture review, but was opposed by the U.S. defense establishment and not supported strongly enough by the State Department because they said the U.S. needed first use to protect NATO allies. So the question is, what would it take for NATO allies, Japan and South Korea, to feel secure under a no first use policy and so agree to such a move? I think it's a very good question and I'm grateful for it. Um, I don't know exactly what it would take, but I think the obvious way if what they fear is conventional attacks that need to be deterred through nuclear weapons, then the obvious solution is for them and for the Americans to build up uh, their ability to um, to react to conventional attacks with conventional means. In other words, for NATO in particular, which I know better than Japan and South Korea, for NATO in particular, the European non-nuclear weapon members of NATO to spend more on uh, conventional um, defense resources, but also to resort to diplomacy more in order to try and um, eliminate uh, the threats to their security that they perceive as coming uh, from other states. There's always this, this, this assumption that the only way to defend against a threat is by developing a kind of counter threat. Of course, that's not, not, not necessarily the case at all. One, people should be more mindful of the potential of diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, next question to John. So uh, this next question, um, so this, this person would like a, a comment on the joint statement by the NWS and the TPNW coming into force in the coming year. Uh, how, in your view, will the persistent objection rule of the IPL play out in regards to the NWS blocking the application of any new norms arising from TPNW to them? Uh, okay, well, thank you for the question. If I understand the question correctly, this relates to um, the nuclear weapon states making persistent statements of objection to the TPNW and saying that they do not regard it as an international norm and they don't intend to join uh, so as to um, help to prevent the interpretation generally developing that the TPNW's prohibition against prohibition against nuclear weapons ever becomes customary international law. Um, and I mean, in that sense, it's a pretty theoretical debate because uh, we're a pretty long way from customary international law uh, in this area. Um, and in a sense, um, 
you know, it's pretty self-evident that for uh, the time being and for some time to come, um, the TPNW uh, and its prohibitions only apply to those states that formally join the treaty. But having said that, I think that the uh, broader and longer term um, influence of the TPNW, regardless of whether it becomes customary law or not, could be quite wide ranging if it affects the behavior of individual states in terms of their domestic politics. For example, if uh, a large number of the world's uh, states and populations feel that uh, nuclear weapons are um, bad and should not be supported, then that might, for instance, affect whether taxpayers in countries supporting nuclear weapons will continue to do that, whether uh, investors in those countries will continue to invest in companies that are involved in the production of nuclear weapons. Um, and so we can sort of expect to see uh, that sort of influence over time if the TPNW is implemented effectively and seen to be implemented effectively by its state's parties, if it's seen as a viable, vibrant regime. And I think that's an open question at the moment. Um, it's now incumbent upon the members of that treaty uh, to show that they can move beyond um, you know, aspirations in order to create a regime that, that is seen to have credibility. And this is not impossible. And they have some good examples uh, to follow in that respect. Uh, there was a lot of resistance, for example, to the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention when it was first negotiated. Uh, and that uh, treaty and the Convention on Cluster Munitions that followed 10 years later have both established themselves as viable international regimes. And of course, they don't have the same countervailing pressures as in the nuclear weapons field. But uh, I think that TPNW member states should take that as a challenge and they should rise to that challenge and focus on implementing the treaty, on resourcing the implementation of the treaty properly and um, solving some of the questions that uh, are still open uh, about the treaty obligations themselves. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, John. Unfortunately, we are reaching the end of our session, so we won't Can have time. Can I just time. say something? Yes, uh, please, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, as the only woman on this panel, I feel I must make an intervention on the gender issue, which the uh, sure. which right. uh, Rafael Gossi has raised, because uh, I think it is a very positive signal that he is, he's giving. Now, of course, it's 2020, and he's talking about 2025, having 50-50 uh, gender equality. Uh, but on the other hand, I commend him for putting it on the map. And I don't know exactly what senior appointments means because what does it mean as of the P5 level or as of a little bit higher, uh, it's uh, very much a matter of interpretation. But I'm also aware that it always depends on the available posts. So it's a, it's a little bit of a balance of you know how you go. But on the other hand, right now, the distribution of the P level in general is two thirds men and one third women. So that isn't very good, frankly. So I must say that I really like him to hold his feet to the fire every year, like how much has it increased? So I just, I'm sorry for holding up for another minute or two, but that was an important issue for me. You're absolutely right. And uh, this actually joins the efforts of other organizations uh, like the, the UN Secretary General, who who's also has a very determined plan to catch up with the um, this lack of uh, equality, as you know, our, our director is also uh, a gender hub uh, leader engineer. So it's it's something that, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, now a lot of people are aware of and working on. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have to time for uh, concluding remarks uh, and or summaries. Um, but I'm sure that uh, our audience has been. Uh, interested uh, by it, what the uh, Director General had to tell us and the comments of our experts. And uh, I would like to thank them very much for their time and, and contribution. And I would like to thank, of course, all the participants who uh, also uh, shared uh, their time with us on this uh, occasion of our 25th anniversary. There's 
still a couple of events left to attend uh, before the end of the day. And so thank you so much. And if you had missed part of the session, you will be able to watch our video on our website. Thank you again. Uh, and uh, also thanks to Federico for uh, uh, arranging and uh, moderating the, the questions and answers. Thank you.